virtual recitation session on Friday, 11 a.m. to noon. Check on Piazza for the Zoom link that will be posted. That will also be recorded and then posted online for everyone else. I'll uh, be covering the assignment. Uh, the other thing is there's a number of the undergrad TAs are hosting um, assignment help sessions next oh, week. Yeah. I think four days next week. So there's a lot of availability. Three next week and then the day of. Yeah. So, okay. Three next week and then the, <laughs> the day, day of. To do. Yeah. Well, that'll be fun. So take advantage of these, these opportunities to ask questions. Start on the homework early. Don't wait till the last minute. Uh, I could say that until I'm blue in the face. But. Um, cool. Okay. Then let's go back to our security clearance. So somebody remind us of where we left off on Tuesday. So what were we looking at? What were we trying to talk about, think about, and why? You don't have to do, cover all of those things, but some of them, yeah. We're talking about like security levels? Security levels, yeah. So what, in particular, what kinds of, or what types of security levels are we talking about? Okay, mandatory access control. The example is military clearance. What's the difference between mandatory access control and discretionary access control? Yeah. In discretionary, users can choose to like lower all um, users. mandatory access control, the system decides to access. So if you own the file, if you create the file, it doesn't matter, you don't get to decide who gets access to that file. Yeah, it's an important distinction to um, just be clear on what exactly the specific differences are in these systems. Okay, cool, so we have um, security levels, we have, we've been using the example of the military um, information security levels, uh, and so we have top secret, secret, classified, and unclassified. So that's the system that we're dealing with. And we came up with this notion and we were trying to discuss and think about if we had a, uh, a system where we wanted to absolutely guarantee that no top secret information could ever flow out to somebody with a lower classification level, what rules would our mandatory access control system need to enforce? Right, so we, we're thinking in terms of subjects and objects, and each of those subjects and objects has a security label associated with them. And through that, we derived basically the rules that you could read down. So if you have a top higher security level, you could read uh, things that are at your security level or lower. Right? You can, a subject can read at, with top security experience and read an unclassified document, uh, but writing only works up. So you can only write documents Else that I'm missing? <clears throat> Tricky. I don't know. Did I miss out? Leave out something deliberately? Did that feel? Well, no. okay. One thing I also went over was like the, the Unix um, bits. Yeah, we went over the Unix bits, but we're over that now. We're <laughs> moving on a little bit back to the theoretical. Um, okay, cool. So, now, and we've talked about some of the problems here. So what's kind of one of the problems of this model, maybe in the real world? There are several. So what are some of the problems? Yeah. Basically, it's saying people with top secret clearance can't even write emails or essays. Right, so one problem is people with top secret clearance literally can't communicate with anybody that does not have top secret clearance. Yeah. Actually being top secret doesn't mean that you need to see all the other information. Yeah, the other one is the, essentially the need to know or the least privilege principle, right? So by having top secret clearance, even if you're only working on one project, this model gives you access to all the top secret information that exists, right? And so we can see that that's um, clearly a uh, a limitation of our model because we want to understand well then how would we try to limit that right so the idea is and kind of the way that this has come up is ideas of security categories so this is thinking about it if ju you have just security levels it's too coarse grain right it's hard to make um, 
fine grained classification decisions. The subjects have access to more things than maybe they absolutely need to know. And so we can introduce this notion of security categories. So we can add this notion of categories to this notion of security levels, and we can get a better system for uh, trying to implement this, this notion of least privilege. Or, and so some of the categories, um, new, I looked these up, these are not, I'm not revealing any information. I also don't know any information, so I can't reveal it. Um, you can Google for different types of categories. Uh, so some of these things, like nuke, would be related to nuclear stuff. NATO is a category. Um, man, I can't even remember what ACE is. Uh, we'll say I made that up. I think it has to do with missiles. Uh, anybody know off the top of their head? It's a weird thing to know, but. The, so yeah, the idea is we need, we can assign both people, so subjects and objects, we can assign them to zero or more categories and that would define what type of access they can get. So then how do we, so then how do we want to think about our policy then? So what's our high level policy security goal that we're trying to um, implement here with our rules that we're going to drive again? Uh, so how has the situation changed? So it used to be our security policy was we don't want any information at a higher security level to leak out to somebody with a lower security level. Is that still true? Yes, we still want that to be the case. What else do we want to be true? Yeah. Only people who need the information have access to the information. Yeah, so only people who need access to the information have access to the information, and more specifically in terms of categories, what does that mean? Yeah. People can only access objects in the same category that they are in? Yeah, so, or maybe phrase the other way, we'd say, um, Objects in a specific category should only be accessed by people with who have that category, right? And it shouldn't leak out to people without that category. <coughs> cool. All right. So now we need to change our notation a little bit. So now we have um, we have for each subject and object now does not just have a security level; they have a level and categories. And so we have uh, and L is the level and C is a set. So what is a set? set, it could be all of the categories, whatever. Uh, it's unordered, which means the order of the categories don't matter. Um, but now we have this question. So now we need to think. And we're going to redo this. So now we have uh, our levels. So we have the same levels. Uh, we have our categories. Right now we'll use the current example, uh, nuke, NATO. It's also annoying these are all caps. Um, uh, ace. Cool. And we have our levels. Uh, we know, and I'll draw this kind of more as a vector because these have an ordering. Uh, top secret, secret, classified, unclassified. And so every, so I could say, uh, so what were our objects before? We had, uh, oh, just, oh, we didn't talk about that. Okay, cool. So now we need to think about, um, okay. So now we need to start thinking about, now in this previous scenarios, we had subjects and objects. So now if we have a subject with, let's say top secret clearance and Let's say nuke, we'll try to keep this similarly. And then we have uh, an object of top secret uh, nuke. Should they be allowed access? Uh, what type of access? We didn't talk about that. Ha. Let's do read. So what do you think? Yes. Yes? yes? Why? doesn't violate our security principles, properties, right? So they have the exact uh, top secret clearance. They have the exact set. Um, what about, let's go uh, top secret 
nuke a secret nuke. Should they be able to read that? Yeah, why? They have a, they're trying to read a document that has lower security clearance. We already agreed in our previous model that that is correct. So we could try other versions of this. Um, a secret with nuclear, reading a top secret with nuclear. Should we allow this? No, why not? Yeah, it'd be somebody reading up, right? So they can only read down. It's somebody at the secret level. So even if they have the same category, right, they still should not be able to read top secret information about that category, right? So all this is showing is that our prior rules are still in effect. They should still operate exactly how we expect them to. Now we need to start thinking about, and the reason why we can see this is the categories are all the same, right? So now we need to think about different scenarios when the categories are not the same. So let's think, uh, what about top secret? Uh, nuke NATO and top secret nuke. Should they be able to read that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why? One of their groups. <coughs> yeah, one of their categories includes the what the object is, right? So they're not getting information that they don't have access to. What about, let's flip it around a little bit. What if we had somebody with top secret clearance who's only classified for nuke and they're reading, a, trying to read a document that is nuclear and NATO. No, yes? And here resounding one way or the other. So we wanna make an argument for why? Yeah. Object needs to be a subset of the subject. Yeah, why? So what in terms of our policy, what does this violate? There's more information in the object that the subject doesn't have access to. <coughs> yeah, that's a great way of phrasing it. So yeah, there's more information, right? This document, whatever it is, contains information about nuclear and NATO, but we only have access to NATO. So this would give us, or we only have access to nuke. So this would give us access to a NATO category object that we should not be able to have access to. So this should be denied. And inherent in there, you, um, so what was your reasoning behind that? What, what were you thinking about there in terms of these sets? Um, like the object isn't a subset of the subject. Right, so the, uh, so kind of where you're thinking is the, let's say the subject's category must be either a subset or equal to the object category, or is it the reverse? Yeah. I always mess this up, so you have to double check. Um, you want the subjects to be bigger. Bigger, yeah. Bigger. Right, so the subject, so yeah, the object, so here, uh, the <coughs> object is not a super a subset of the subject, which would mean we should deny it, right? So it means there's more information in that object. And the other case we need to then think about is how does this then work with uh, TS? Maybe we can think like this. I have no categories, but I do have top secret clearance. But I'm trying to access a secret document that's classified as new. Should I allow that? <coughs> but it passes this check, right? <coughs> no, it doesn't pass this check, right? Yeah. But it does pass our other reading down, so it's reading down, but because the object, the, um, uh, because the object is, the object's category is not a subset of the subject's category, Right? It doesn't contain it in there. We should not be able to access this. So even though we have the highest level clearance, we are not clear to that category. That means we cannot read documents that are in a lower security level with that category. So this is, again, how you get that nice fine-grained uh, separation.
So what's our rule then? So what's our original rule? Let's say the uh, level, you can read if the level of the subject is, what do we say, greater than or equal to the level of the object? Is this it? We're done? <coughs> How do we take the categories into account? Yeah. You end it with what you wrote at the top right. With end it with this thing up here? Yeah, so the, I guess I'm going to flip the O's and C's. I hope that's not super confusing. Uh, the category of the object needs to be a um, subset of the ah, categories. Yeah, category. Right, and then now we have our nice rule. So we still are reading down just like before, but now we have this interesting subset relationship. So there's kind of a, I want to take a little time to graph this to see what this looks like. So we have three. So could we draw, just like we did with the levels, could we draw a diagram that said kind of who, if you have what clearance, where could you read from? Can we use the line like we did before? We'll go to the top, right? So this reading down, is like a graphical representation of you can read if the uh, level of the subject is greater than or equal to the level of the object. Right? Can we do something similar with the categories? So let's think about it like this. Can I do something like this? So I say uh, this is a set with uh, Nuke and NATO and Ace. And then can I do nuke NATO? And then the empty set. Gotta do something like a read down relationship here. But well, what's the problem? There's, you can, it's a variable, like you can take ace out, you can also take NATO out, you can take nuke out. Yeah, so I haven't actually specified all possible combinations of these three these three categories, right? But can I draw that? Yeah, I can enumerate that. It's not impossible. So let's do that and see what happens. All right, uh, I gotta plan this out for a second. Okay. Oh, I'm just gonna write it again. Okay. So we'll start at the top. We have all the categories. We have nuke, NATO, Ace, and then we have, so what do we have, Nuke and NATO? And Nuke and Ace. And then we have uh, Ace and NATO, or NATO and Ace maybe? And then what do we have at the second? So are there any more two, two element sets? Nope, we've got that all. So then we have nuke. Uh, we have NATO. We have ace. At the bottom, empty set. Yeah, so we've constructed right the power set of this original set. We have all the possible subsets of that set. We can draw them. Uh, we could even, I don't know, draw circles around them to start making a graph. So then if we think about it, so what's the relationship like between, we'll start at the bottom, these four nodes. So can, if we, if a subject has nuclear, can they read an object that has an empty set? Yeah, so we can draw an arrow down like this. What about NATO to empty set? Yeah. What about ACE to empty set? Yeah. What about nuclear to NATO? Yeah. And what about NATO to nuclear? Yeah. And the same logic applies with NATO to ACE and ACE to NATO. So this is why we don't have a nice um, 
total ordering of all of these sets, right? We can't, there's no relationship between nuclear and NATO, the second chain nuclear and the second chain NATO, right? There's no subset relationship there because neither is a subset of the, of the other one. So there's no arrows we can draw there, right? So if you have nuclear clearance, it doesn't matter. Uh, you, no matter what security level you are, you can't access a document that just has NATO access. Cool, all right, then what do we do at this level? So nuclear and NATO? So is there an arrow, is there an arrow down to the empty set? Yeah, let's not draw it for now because that's gonna be a lot of arrows. Uh, what about each of these? So nuclear and NATO? So is nuclear a subset of nuclear and NATO? Yeah, so we can draw an arrow here. What about this one? Yeah. Cool, and then anything that's a subset of this will be a subset of this, right? We have a transitive, so we don't need to draw that extra line that's implied. All right, let's finish this out. So then nuclear and ACE. Oh wait, so nuclear NATO, is ACE a subset of nuclear NATO? No, so there's no arrow here. Uh, nuclear and ACE, is nuclear a subset of nu and NATO ACE? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about NATO? And ACE? Mm -hmm. All right, final one. Gonna go here and here. And last one at the top. Ah. Oh, it's gonna bug me, but it's fine. <laughs> right, so what in this graph is a subset of the set nuclear, NATO, and ACE? Everything. Everything, right? But we can just do draw arrows, let's say here to the top three. And then we know by transitive all those are subsets. So now we've constructed a, um, and this is actually a, Uh, this actually, this model of the graphically representing subset relationship or things like that comes up a lot of times in other areas of computer science. It's called a lattice. Um, you can do things like this. It comes up in weird things like program analysis and a lot of areas where you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, so it's interesting to see it here come up, which is why we took a lot of time to do this and derive this. Uh, but using this, now we have this nice model of reading down, right? Graphically, just like we had before, we can pick, if we know where our subject is, so then how would we do that? So let's say my subject is, uh, this is my subject and this is my object. Uh, can the subject read that object? No, and how would you define that in terms of this graph? transitive nature too, so we can also see, okay, there's no path, there's no way that this subject can read this object, right? Cool. All right, but we're not, our policy is not just concerned about reading, right? What was the, uh, what else are we concerned with? Right. Writing. Writing, and now we need to consider that. So let's go back and look at these scenarios and what we think about writing. Okay, so should somebody with top secret and nuclear be able to write an object of top secret and nuke? Yeah. Uh, top secret and nuke be able to write an object of secret and nuke? Yeah. No, why not? Yeah. It violates the writing up principle. Right, it violates the you can only write up principle, which we derived uh, on Tuesday. Awesome. Cool. Uh, what about a secret with nuke? Could they write a top secret with nuke? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about a top secret with nuke and NATO? Could they write a document that's top secret and nuke? If we think just our old security policy, should they be able to do it? Yeah, so your top secret level, you should be able to write a top secret document. But should they be able to do this now with our categories? No, why not? Somebody defend it. They have both nuke and NATO. They have both nuke and NATO. Right, so they have access to both nuclear and NATO data, and by the same logic, um, why you can't create uh, write down, here they may be putting NATO information into that nuclear document. 
right? So this is information leaking out from one category to another category, which is something we want to absolutely uh, not allow. Okay. What about, I have top secret and nuke. Can I write a document with top secret, nuke, and NATO? Yes. No? I heard multiple things. Yes. Yeah. State your position first. Uh, I think you can write it because if you only have access to Nuke and then you write a NATO do a document or you're not going to leak any information that you don't have access to. Like, okay. If it was the other way around, you would be. Okay, so we have a position for allow. What about deny? Yeah. You can you can write the uh, information from Nuke to NATO. Mm. So the other, the deny is that you have access to nuclear information and you're creating a document that is both nuclear and NATO. So this means somebody else with, uh, okay. Yeah, they, they, again? they need both nuke and NATO if they want to write to that or read it even, right? Right, okay, so yes, you almost got me, but very close. So yeah, the, um, so if we think about this document here, can somebody with top secret and NATO, can they read this document? No, no because uh, they don't have access to the nuclear information. So the only people that can read this document must have at least the set nuclear and NATO. They could have other things, um, but that's fine for reading, it's about writing. Cool, so the only, I guess the way we can reason about this, the only people that can read this document will absolutely must have access to nuclear information, right? There's no possible way to read this document if you don't already have access to nuclear information. Uh, the fact that we're adding additional security categories on here doesn't really matter in terms of information leakage because it's not gonna leak out. Everyone agree with that? Okay, what about this? So you're a person with top secret and no categories. You wanna write a secret document with nuclear. No, why, why no? Yeah. You have to write up, you can't write down. Yeah, so from the categories it makes sense. Like we just said, yes, this should be able to do it by the categories, but the security levels also come into play. And this would be an instance of writing top secret information to a secret document, which violates our security policy. Cool. So then, just like we did before, so then what are the rules for if we had to write this, what are the rules for writing? So we'll call this R for reading. And what about for writing? So what's our original rule? L of S is less than or equal to L of O. L of S is less than or equal to L of O. And we need another clause <coughs> and what? C. Yeah. C of S is a subset of C of O. C of S is a subset or equal to C of O. And so how does that change our lattice? Yeah, it goes the opposite direction, right? So we can draw the same lattice starting from the empty set and going down, and that would say all the ways that you could write. Uh, and so we have basically, or you could flip all of the arrows here. And you can, so basically again, we have the similar type of thing with a different model of reading down and writing up. So if you only have empty set permissions, you can't write to anything with permissions on it. So you, you can, if you have empty set, just like if you have uh, unclassified level, you could create documents that are top secret, even though you don't have access to that. Um, because that, there's still no way that top secret information is leaking out. Um, in a similar way, if you have an empty set, right, you have no privileges, you can create a document that is nuclear, NATO, and ACE, and there's, there's no way that information is leaking out of the system. Right, it's both of them are kind of a similar argument. Yeah. So this model prevents any information from being leaked. What about being destroyed? Like someone at the bottom just wants to write all my documents there. Yeah, we don't care about that. <laughs>
But should the right graph have arrows pointing to each other? So if let's add that here. Do we have an example of that? We did not. Okay. I'm going to add this example here. TS. Okay. So you have top secret clearance with nuclear. You want to write to it. You want to read. We'll start with reading. You want to read from a document that's top secret in NATO. Should that be allowed? No, because you'd be accessing information from the NATO category that you should not have access to, right? This violates our basic property. Okay, and then from writing, so should we be able to write nuclear information to a document that is specified NATO? No. Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. Why? Uh, it, the right by the writing rule, it's uh, S is a subset or equal to. So the category of the subject is a nuke? Yeah. Is that a subset or equal to of NATO? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> you can just say no. <laughs> right? And why not? So intuitively why, yeah. You could leak some information about nuclear to someone who only has clearance for NATO. Yeah, so the people that can read this document have access only to NATO. They don't have access to nuclear. So you could be writing nuclear information to this document that is readable by people who don't have access to that security yeah, that was a great example. I should have come up with that. Um, so yeah, this is why in both models, this is disallowed. So you can't read from any documents like this, and you also can't write to any documents like this. Cool. All right. So yeah, so if you want a prettier version, it's on the slides. Uh, you can look at this. Although, I don't know. I think I did a decent job. Uh, but anyways, you have the lattice model there. And this is actually one of the most famous um, security models in computer science. Um, basically, or sorry, I guess, I don't know, not computer science, but definitely security. So everyone in security knows this. It's called the bell Lepadula model uh, because I believe two people named Bell and Lepadula uh, came up with this model in a paper. Um, and then, so you can do things like once you have this model, you can prove that with those rules, no information can leak out. Um, and so, but you already derived this. So you're smarter than these people, so good, good for you. Uh, so we, we have this. And so the other thing, and the way that um, we'll represent this here is um, in terms of in lattice terminology. So dominates is what we're talking about here. Um, so that that's uh, how you can phrase in a lattice model that this so you could say uh, the set containing NATO and ACE dominates the set containing ACE. There's a uh, because of the subset or equal to operation that we're using. Um, you could not say that NATO and ACE dominates nuclear and ACE, right? Because there's no way to compare those. Those are you can't uh, compare those at all. So just in this model, what we'll use um, is this notion of dominates, and what that means is uh, less. Uh, in this example, we're using categories. But yeah, you basically, we derived all of this, right? So we have the uh, security level and we have, so we have uh, the security level and the categories. Um, okay, so I'll leave this here. We're not gonna go over this because we just went through a bunch of examples. If you want more practice, check this out. Um, and so this is kind of the most, and again, of course this model has a lot of problems which we talked about, right? Clearly, it doesn't make sense to give somebody top secret clearance and say, by the way, you can no longer talk to literally anyone who does not have top secret clearance, right? So there is, in the real world, notion of um, they uh, make it very clear when things are supposed to be top secret and not, so that you know what information you're not supposed to leak out. Um, there are ways of declassifying documents. So if a document was originally classified at the top secret level, there are ways to eventually, maybe over time or whatever, uh, reduce the security level of that document. And that's done with review and maybe through redacting and removing information from that document. So it's no longer, the top secret information is no longer in there. Um, what else? Um, you have this. 
interesting conundrum that maybe you don't really think about. So you, like with a physical document, let's say you have a top secret document. Um, how do you know, and, but you only have secret clearance, how do you know if you should read the document? You start reading and then stop and go, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably bad. Yeah, you actually need a cover page on top of it that is unclassified that, or maybe classified at a certain level that only those people can read that specifies what the security level is and what the categories are applied to that so you can know if you should open that document or not. Um, there's, yeah, all kinds of interesting stuff in here. And thinking more broadly to other types, and then the other thing I'll say very briefly is this notion, so um, we talked about discretionary access control is on most, uh, basically the basis of all Unix machines. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, I was gonna say, or what, um, what are like the consequences too of this system? Like what happens if you do read like a document you shouldn't read? Uh, I think we have some military people here. Do they know the answer to that question? Uh, Depends how it's removed. Uh, yeah, you can lose your clearance. Well, you can get your clearance removed. You can get uh, disciplinary action. So the guy that took a picture in the back in the engine room of the submarine, and he, I think he got like prison time for it because whatever's back there is classified. So, and even the manuals are classified themselves. So everybody on a submarine has to have at least a secret clearance. So. Yeah, so yeah, big problems, right? I think it's dependent on the specific scenario and, and all of those things. But yeah, this is, you know, your entire apparatus is built around keeping information secret. And so you need penalties with people to violate those. Cool, that was a cool example. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Uh, Mac and DAC. So uh, discretion access controls on every Linux system you use, uh, Windows systems. Um, anybody use Android devices? Yeah, so there's actually a Mac system built into Android called, uh, I think it's SE Android for Security Enhanced. Uh, there's also a Mac system for SE Linux. And the idea is, um, so for instance, if you think about a web server, a web server runs as a specific user on your system, but you may want to actually restrict what things they can do even further. So if somebody compromises your web server, they can't just do anything that user can do. So you can uh, use uh, SE Linux, Security Enhanced Linux, to write policies that mandatory say uh, the uh, web server user cannot, can only read and write to this folder. And that means if anybody compromises it, they can't alter and change other files on your system that even though that user should be able to have access to. Um, and the similar thing exists on Android. So it locks down a lot of system services so that uh, and this policy is actually under root too. So usually they have that like, even if you're root, you can't change and act like, you can restrict what root can do and what other users can do. Um, so this is, in, and actually the other interesting thing is this notion of mandatory access control on Unix systems came from the NSA. So this idea of, um, I think SE Linux came out of the NSA as a way to apply mandatory access control ideas to a Unix system, which I think is super cool. Uh, but there are other types of access control systems that we're not gonna talk about, but, uh, but that, or we'll talk about them briefly here, um, but we're not gonna go into depth like we did the other ones. So some of the things other things, that, and this is a big area, and this makes more intuitive sense, and I think when we started talking about access control, people brought up examples of this, right? We talked about with the um, access control matrix, one of the big problems is we have every single user on there, right? But as we talked about on a homework server, there's different roles for different users. We have uh, you know, professors, TAs, and students, right? So rather than thinking about the access of every single individual person, if we group them into roles, we could make access control uh, policies based on their roles. Um, so you can base, um, and this is basically the essential idea here, is create the user's permission based on the user's role. Um, so what are the benefits of this? Yeah. Your TA can't get access to the final exam? Yeah, maybe, or maybe I want them to. Maybe, like, I don't have to, it makes it easier to administer this, right? So if I have three TAs, um, then I don't have to change their permissions for every single user, right? I can specify, okay, now TA should have access to this, and that's just done. Uh, 
think about that multiplied by students, right? 370 students, if I need you to have access to a file on my system, adding that for all those users can be a major pain, but if I just say, hey, all students now have access to this directory, bang, it just works and it updates. Uh, what are some drawbacks? Yeah, it can be, it's difficult to get user specific. So when might that come up in like an organization? Yeah. Like the CEO of the CEO position? Yeah, so like, okay, CEO for the CEO position. Um, yeah, that, so why would? Because like that would be like an individual user, or if you have like a, like contractors come in, they're not like different contractors might have different things. Mm, that's a great one. So people may not have well-defined roles. Right? You may bring in contractors for a specific project that need weird custom permissions that you have to create for each of these contractors. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Well, yeah. Um, like, I think both positive and negative, it makes like a hierarchy. So, like, someone at the top could maybe have access to things that they shouldn't, whereas someone at a lower role might need something, and vice versa. Yeah, so. It, it doesn't, I would say it doesn't necessarily have to be in a hierarchy. It can be more, you can think of it a little bit in subset relationships, right? So it may be that the administrators have access to information that marketing people don't, but that marketing people have information that the admins can't necessarily directly access or something. Um, yeah, it can be very difficult. Also standardizing what roles need what can be difficult. You may have a marketing person, actually that's probably a good example, like a marketing person, um, who's uh, working for a specific team may be different than the marketing person that's working for the CEO, right? Even though they're technically both in the same role, they have different responsibilities, different things they need to have access to. And so now you have to customize and tweak these individual things. Um, so anyways, uh, but it does map pretty nicely onto a business. And this is why it's used in a lot of businesses because it's pretty easy and you know, you could probably, so what are some examples of real systems that you use that have this notion of role-based access control? Active Directory. What was that? Active Directory. Active Directory definitely has this. Yeah, what else? What about websites? Ever use a website? <laughs> I think you could apply it to a house, like a, a family member is allowed access into the house. But also okay, that's good. So a house, uh, family members, yeah, you could group people like that, or maybe kids and adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a Google Doc? Like there's uh, an owner? There's yeah, a Google Doc has different roles. You can uh, own the document. You can have a writer role, I think they call it, and a reader role. So you can be able to read the document but not actually change the content of that document. Yeah. Canvas. Canvas has roles. Uh, my ASU has roles. I see different things than you see. Grayscope has roles. Piazza has roles, right? All these things because it maps nicely to what the level that we're talking about. Um, cool.
severely apologize, but I don't think any data was lost, so that was fine. Um, so yeah, you have to worry about, so that's kind of like a mix of mandatory, I think, and um, a role-based system. And we could take that, and they've taken this notion of roles even further. So you could think of your role as one attribute of you as a user, right? Here's my identity, I am this user. One of my attributes is I am the role of a professor, uh, but there's other attributes about you as a, you know, your person. Um, you could be thinking of things like age, ID, ID number, group membership, what classes you're in as a student are part of your, um, your attributes. Um, so kind of some, uh, kind of the cool way we like to uh, think about this, and you can make policies that are complex Boolean expressions of all of these things. So you could say, well, the only people should be able to access this are users of whatever, this age and that are in this group or something. Um, and one of the really cool things about this, uh, one of our students was thinking about and doing some research. So um, you can also, we'll get to CryptoNet, you can cryptographically verify that these are actually what they, like that, that, um, that you have this attribute. So for instance, uh, if you're not old enough for this, theoretically, uh, when you, what's the policy on purchasing alcohol in Arizona? Yeah, you have to be 21 or older, right? That's an attribute of yourself. How do you prove that you're 21 and older? You give them your ID. What else is on that ID? Is, so let's think about it this way. Is your ID something that just says, yes, you're over 21? Yeah. What well, says that? What else does it have on it? Picture, your birth date, your picture, your name. Could right? I have your social security? Uh, I don't think I have a social security. Number, <laughs> no, I could. could. You yeah. still have the option to. Yeah, so there's different documents you can present, right? So, uh, so the idea is you're giving all of these attributes, this large set of attributes to a person to verify only one of those attributes. Um, wouldn't it be cool if you could just, I don't know, give them, send them something on your phone that the state has actually verified that you, like cryptographically verified you are of age and that's the only piece of information they learn about you. They don't learn about your name or where you live or anything else just from looking at your ID. Um, anyways, it's kind of thinking of that notion in terms of attribute-based access control. So you only check the attributes that you actually need and you don't care about anything else. Yeah? So is that basically automatically assigning roles? Part of it, it's thinking, it's expanding that more broadly and thinking of your role is only one attribute of you as a user. Um, other context we've thought about this is in terms of um, complex like research networks be between multiple institutions. So what they do is they set up these like huge pipes that can, I don't know, you're doing physics research which generates terabytes and terabytes of data, but you need to share that with collaborators. So the question is how do you fairly share this information, like this pipe that you all purchased and spent, I don't know, multiple millions of dollars on. So you can have, you can think of attributes of you, your project, your traffic, and define rules that say, if it's a super high priority, then it gets the most access. But if the bandwidth being used is less than a certain amount, then you have access. And so you can uh, create these complex policies around these notions of attributes. Um, so it can extend beyond the user. It can be situation specific, all kinds of stuff. <coughs> Bless you. Um, and so kind of then looking forward, so kind of some of the research that's being done in access control is around this notion of usability. So we talked about, actually we even discussed the usability when thinking about access control lists, capability lists, right? We looked at these models and we tried to see, um, I don't know, how usable would it be to write some policy or change something, right? So there's um, interesting ways, there's a whole language in XML uh, to write and a standard language to define access control policies in XML. Uh, but writing XML for access control policies can be a huge pain and it's very much a specialized uh, thing. And so there's a lot of research into like, how do you make it so that normal people can like write these policies that they want? Um, flexibility, so how flexible is your access control system? This is what we talked about a little bit with um, the problem of the Unix model of being able to create these custom subsets of groups that need access to things. Um, expressiveness. 
This is again what we've talked about of what types of things can your model express or not express? What kind of policies do you want and how easy or difficult it is, it, is it to get those policies? And the other interesting thing is kind of this notion of federation and this means so you have two entities that want to work together. How do they share or map access with each other? So one of the interesting things, uh, does anybody use like uh, signing with Google or signing with Facebook as part of a web service? Right, so you're essentially logging on to Facebook and Facebook is telling this website, yes, you are this user, I have verified it. Um, and then that website has to trust that from Facebook. Um, and they can get information about you from Facebook, but you can actually control what information this website gets, right? So there's complex kind of access control in these two competing organizations. Um, so how do you do that? How do you manage that is kind of a complex, interesting problem. There's a lot of problems to be solved here. Well, one of the cool things that one of our postdocs is working on is um, how to do access control in terms of, um, well, I think first they were looking at augmented reality, so specifically games like Pokemon Go, uh, because a lot of places don't want them to be a, I don't know, they want Pokemon, they want people coming inside to look for Pokemon, like I don't know, in the middle of a class or something. So how could like ASU say, a geographic location like Armstrong Hall during these times should not be um, accessible and then how do you actually enforce that on the system uh, all this kind of stuff so there's interesting research here to be done any questions on access control all right ready for some crypto we well, don't really have a choice so you might as well say yes <laughs> and that's not true you can always leave I won't be offended. <laughs> All right. Actually, you know what? I'm a, mm, no, same video. I don't really care that much. Okay, cool. So now we're going to get into cryptography. Um, so what the heck is cryptography? So what do you think? You've been alive for a certain number of years. You've probably heard this term before. What does it mean to you? Have you even said it? Okay, using math to make and break code, and by code you're not talking about like programming code, right? Yeah. Different type of code, yeah. Like concealing information through reversible, but like hard to reverse engineer, like optically processes. Yeah, so some notion of um, hiding information, hiding, right? So hiding information using math. So that's kind of what we think of when we think about codes. What else? Ooh, maybe concealing information through a public channel, right? So not just uh, concealing information by putting it in my pocket, but if I have some information and I, uh, I don't want to get too much into terms yet, but I encoded it, let's say, although we're going to get rid of that word, and I put it on the screen, none of you should be able to figure out what that means, right? Or maybe you can if I told you my secret or something. What else? who sent a message, right? So we want a way to verify that this user actually did send this message and it's not spoofed by somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Who's the person that comes to mind when I think it's like a user effect, right? Yeah, we'll get into that. Um, yeah, so simple, simple old school types of ciphers. Um, awesome. Yeah, do you use cryptography in your daily life? Yeah, are you writing notes to each other in secret? Yeah, anytime you access an HTTPS website, so this is not just securing your communication from people
people uh, listening to it, but also verifying identity. So it's doing both of those things we want, right? It's verifying the identity that this website you are actually talking to Google.com and an attacker didn't trick you to go to my site. Um, cool. Uh, nobody mentioned like Bitcoin or any kind of <laughs> cryptocurrencies. This is not cool anymore, is that? <laughs> It was really big for a long time, and now none of the students, I guess, seem to care. Yeah. I have a question. I just, I just recently did my taxes at you last night, mm -hmm. and one of the questions on there, I think. I cannot do your taxes, but that's fine. <laughs> one of the questions on there, which I've never seen, was have you gained any money off of cryptocurrency? Uh, and I thought that was weird. Yeah, well, I mean, it's something you have to, you should report anyways, but I guess a lot of people don't. Is that the point of cryptocurrency? <laughs> no, you're still making money from selling something, so it doesn't matter that it's a cryptocurrency. By owning it, you. I don't, you would not have to report that, but. No, okay, it's cryptocurrency I mean, dumb. It's, it's kind of like the same thing, it's uh, in plain sight, but it's, you know, it's not a, a simple trick to just decode it, whether it's your, your wallet address or. Uh, yeah, so crypt cryptocurrencies have a lot of, they use a lot of cryptography, let's say, but they're not necessarily cryptography itself, yeah. Cryptographically encoded, so anybody can tap in and listen to your phone calls by default. Well, not anybody. You need a lot of special privileges, but uh, uh, yeah, there is no end-to-end -end encryption on phone calls. Uh, I think things like WhatsApp calling are encrypted, though, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, yeah. Checksums when you download uh, files, you want to verify your encryption. Yeah, so verifying that a file that you download is actually what it, what the what the site says that it should be, so that it's exactly the same. Uh, anybody use Git or GitHub? Yeah, you need to see those funky hexadecimal letters on every commit, right? That's a cryptographic hash of your commit that uniquely identifies it. Yeah. When you SSH into like the general server. Yeah, when you SSH into any server, Bandit, you've all done that. So you definitely it's like the first S stands, stands for secure, so it's secure shell. That's what SSH stands for. Yeah. What about like a FaceTime or a Skype? I think, so there's multiple different types, let's say. When I say end-to-end, -end, I mean um, not even a signal or WhatsApp, or in this case, that case, Facebook could read what your communication is. I think the way Skype works, I know it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah, it may be encrypted. I'm not 100% certain. What was the other one? FaceTime? Yeah. I don't know the details. It might be. <coughs> possible, yeah. Some email? Email, ooh, does Stop. anybody actually get encrypted email? I mean, you can use like Proton Mail, that's encrypted. Uh, that is true, okay, so Proton Mail is encrypted on their servers, so they can't see what emails you have. But when you send an email with Proton, it's getting sent to the other person in the clear. If you send it to somebody else who's using Proton, then Ah, there you go, there you go, I see. Okay, Proton to Proton, yeah. Now, what is like a security through like obscurity fall, like if someone's using like a messaging service or something that no one knows to the point that like no one ever looks into. Uh, we'll talk about it, but it's bad. So security up through obscurity is no no security basically. So even uh, there's been cases of criminals using like Xbox Live to yeah, chat with each exactly other and stuff thinking. like that. But they, you know, what, as soon as you're big enough to identify, they will identify it and find you. Um, it's especially bad with using a centralized service because they can go with a subpoena to Microsoft and say, hey, we need all the messages that were sent between these users. And Microsoft will give it to them because they have that data. Yeah. Uh, hopefully passwords. Hopefully passwords. Yeah, we'll talk about passwords too. Yeah. The torrent protocol to download files. The torrent protocol. I don't know that it's encrypted by default. You can encrypt it, but you do have to verify, I think with a hash, a uh, cryptographic hash, that the file that you downloaded is the right file or chunk, not the whole file, but in the chunks. Yeah, there's an option, I think, to encrypt your torrent connection, but I don't know that it's on by default. Yeah? So how does it work, for example, with debit cards and FaceTime? Yeah, credit cards, debit cards, right? So you hope something is going on, but yeah. that, like, you know, uh, the longer version is it's complicated, the shorter version, especially with the chip and pin, so when you have the, the chip there, um, it does some stuff to verify, like, I think it does actual computation on that little chip, 
somebody with a tower, which costs like $200, $250 to make their own, they can trick you to connect to your tower, which your phone will do auto automatically because it's the closest and strongest. Uh, they can tell you, tell your phone that this tower doesn't support any encryption. And so your phone will say, great, okay, here's my call, and we'll do everything over that. But then when it gets to the tower and then to the telcos, then it's basically Oh, Facebook Messenger. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because they bought WhatsApp and WhatsApp had end-to-end -end encryption. Um, yeah, cool. So we can break it down a little bit. Uh, oh yeah, you want to add? So if it requires end-to-end -end encryption if you're sending data, but you're allowed to stack a point of over to get the context and it's not encrypted, how would that work? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, it's actually definitely not secure form of thing where they say faxes are fine because if we said they're not fine everything would blow up everybody already has a fax right because they had to happen last year so yeah that makes sense okay so if we look at the term cryptography itself it's and i don't speak greek but it's derived from the greek words of hidden secret and writing so there's kind of all these notions we've been talking about we want to keep things secret so this is where we're going to really uh, start to focus on uh, confidentiality, but we'll also look at integrity that actually cryptography can help us in terms of integrity. Um, and so it's trying to answer the question of how do we keep information secret or hidden that we want to, right? And this again also has notions, a little bit of access control we need, because we need to think about, well, who should have access to this, right? So that's kind of why we're going in this progression. Um, so we'll define some terms. So encryption, and this is what we'll start using from now on so we can be very clear when we're talking about cryptography. Um, oh, maybe I should, uh, we'll probably say it when I get there, but I'm also not a cryptographer in case you don't know. Um, so I know how to use cryptographic elements. Um, I know what they're supposed to do, what they should do. I don't understand the math to be able to prove it to you of why they do certain things, so we will take commonly accepted uh, things as truths. Uh, I don't know, it's just an FYI. There's crypto people there, they are very math oriented, I am not that, so. Um, but I can still teach you some stuff, hopefully. Uh, so encryption, so basically we can think of it as transforming a message such that its information is hidden, right? So we wanna take a, and we'll define other terms, we wanna take a message and we want to encrypt it so that no one else can read it or that very you know, few people can read it. And then decryption is going to be the reverse. So taking some information that's been encrypted and we want to decrypt it back to the original message. Questions on this? Encryption, decryption. Okay. Then we're going to talk about and we're going to study and look at several types of crypto systems. So. Basically, systems that describe how to encrypt or and usually decrypt messages. So we'll look at several different types of crypto systems, starting from early ones. You're going to be able to break your homework assignment. will be breaking these early crypto systems. And so every crypto system we think of, uh, we'll talk about different types of things. We'll talk about plain text. So plain text is the message in its original form. So this is a um, whatever message you're trying to send. It could be text, it could be a fax, it could be um, an email, it could be a JPEG, which is a certain file format composed of a bunch of different bytes. Uh, whatever it is, plain text, this is the message that we want to send. Ciphertext is gonna be the message in its encrypted form. So we take the, the plain text, we encrypt it, we get ciphertext, we decrypt that, and now we get plain text. Cool, good. All right, a cryptographer is someone who invents encryption algorithms. As I'm gonna hopefully pound into your brains by the end of this, uh, you should not do this. <laughs> do not create cryptographic algorithms unless you're doing it just for fun. Uh, speaking of, there's been 
tons and tons of uh, breaks uh, cryptography systems. The most recent one was, did you hear about the Windows one? Uh, so there was this massive vulnerability that they found that essentially in some uh, elliptic curve crypto system that Microsoft supported, the attacker could supply one of the parameters that they shouldn't be able to supply, and that would let them uh, essentially let an attacker decrypt or make the system think that everything was true and fine when really the attacker had broken it. So this would allow them to intercept your Windows updates, to be able to push any kind of updates. It would allow them to break any uh, HTTPS site that you were visiting by forging a certificate that your computer would think was legit. Uh, all kinds of massive bad. This just came out like three weeks ago, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll send out, I'll make a post on Piazza. So, you know, even very, very, very smart people can design cryptographic either algorithms or systems, and those can often have flaws. So. Um, this is especially true in the cryptocurrency realm where people do weird stuff that doesn't make sense and it turns out to have vulnerabilities. Uh, crypt analyst is somebody on, on the more black hat side to break either encryption algorithms or implementations. So uh, cryptographers build things, crypt analysts uh, analyze things, try to find vulnerabilities, all that kind of stuff. Questions? Plain text, encrypt, ciphertext, decrypt, plain text. Okay, so some of the benefits we're gonna get out of crypto cryptography, as we talked about confidentiality, that's gonna be the main focus, right? We wanna keep secret information secret. This is the goal. Uh, we want, also we'll see uh, notions of integrity. So we'll see, um, and this kind of, uh, let's say, even just in our primitive example, we have some uh, message so we have the plain text message, it's been encrypted into ciphertext. Now what if an attacker takes that ciphertext and just randomly changes things? When we decrypt that, how do we know that the person originally tried to send us this thing? If, if our crypto system is good, it should decrypt to garbage. But how do we know they weren't trying to send us garbage in the first place? How do we know that it hasn't been tampered with, that the original plain text is what it's supposed to be? Yeah. In certain schemes, there's like signing yeah, we'll, we'll get into it, we'll get into it. But I'm saying this is the questions that we're gonna definitely try to answer and why it's important to have them in a crypto system. Yeah, exactly. And we'll also see uh, authentication. So we're gonna study authentication next so we can understand how crypto actually supports authentication. Um, so a lot of these things we talk about with hashing and everything are a cryptography basis. And non-repudiation is another interesting one. So this is, again, we could um, have a scenario where um, I can send a message to the class and I can't ever say, well, I never sent that message, right? You can have cryptographic and mathematically verified proof that says I sent that message at that time, right? So like no takesies, backsies, I guess I can think about that. All right, we'll define a crypto system as a quintuple. So this is okay, we're just gonna define things. Don't freak out. Um, we have a set of plain text, so this is M. M is a set of basically what's the language of our plain text. We have some set of keys. What are the keys to this crypto system? Uh, we can have a set of ciphertext. That's going to be the output of our encryption function. And we have an encryption function. So you can think of an encryption function literally as a function. So if you're not used to reading this type of syntax, you can think of it as E is a function that takes in two parameters, one from M, one from K, and outputs C. So what does that mean in our system? It takes in a plain text and a key and outputs ciphertext. It's exactly just more formal notation than what we were talking about, but it's exactly what we would want from an encryption function. Um, the other important thing, so it's a mathematical function. So what does that mean different from like a function that you would write in your code? Yeah, exactly. Or the same input always gives you the same output. The other way to think about it, there's no global state. 
there's the way in programming, there's no global variables. Whatever these two inputs are, you're given the exact same um, plain text, the exact same key, it will produce the same ciphertext. <coughs> or possibly, but yes, it's a function of those things that it gives you output. There's no global things in there. Anyway, just trying to help you think about mathematical functions and how they map to what you do. Uh, so decryption function, right, does the opposite, takes in a ciphertext and a key and outputs a plain text, right? And a good crypto system should be that if we, well, if we use the right, if we have uh, the key that was used in the, well, I don't want to say this, it's not true for everything. Um, but we want n to be the same, let's say this. Like we want, we take the ciphertext, the correct key, and that gives us the right message, the original plain text message. Cool. All right, we will go very briefly over uh, Caesar cipher. Uh, I want you to be thinking about this. I'm gonna ask, well, somebody remind me if I don't remember, but I probably will. Uh, think about if you've ever invented a crypto system. I wanna hear about it on Tuesday. Um, but one of the most famous and oldest uh, crypto systems is what's known as the Caesar cipher. And this comes from literally Julius Caesar's day. Right, you can think of, it's kind of impressive, even back then, uh, probably writing itself was a cipher, right? Because you could write something and not many people could read. Um, but you still wanna maybe send a message to your generals and you want it to be that nobody can intercept that message and read what was going on, right? So we had a, a simple crypto system, so I like this. So uh, if he had anything confidential to say, he wrote it in a cipher. That is, by so changing the order of the letters in the alphabet that not a word could be made out. If anyone wishes to decipher these and get at their meaning, he must substitute the fourth letter of the alphabet, namely D for A, and so on with the others. So what is this describing? Yeah. You shift all the like, characters in a message by a set like, amount. Yeah, so you shift all the characters in a message by a set amount. So in this case, the key would be four. So when you're encrypting the message, every A, you shift four letter overs to D, uh, and so on and so forth for all the other letters. So we can actually think about this in terms of our crypto system. We have messages, so we can't, clear, so we also, if we're just thinking about A through Z, we can't consider uppercase versus lowercase, because we're only thinking A through Z, right? So our messages are combined of only sequences of letters, right? So this defines what type of language our crypto system works with. Our key is an integer from 0 to 25, right? Well, how come, why does 26 not make sense? Or 27 or 28? Yeah, because it's also represented by the key 0, 1, 2, right? Because if you do it 27 times, you'll wrap around. Then our encryption becomes exactly what we talked about. So, um, so if we want to encrypt uh, with the key K for all letters M in the message, we encrypt it by you doing M plus K. So if we think of A as zero, we would add four to it, which becomes D, mod 26, which wraps us all the way around at the end so that uh, ooh, Z plus four would be C, is that right? Um, and then we have to decrypt, so then how do we decrypt this system? What do we need to decrypt it? Yeah, we need the key. All right, if we have the key, if we know the key is four, we can decrypt by moving every letter back four. So we can write that here as just a 26 plus C minus K mod 26, whatever, but you can think of it just moving along that line. And our ciphertext is the same as the, um, the set is the same. Cool, all right, so I want you to think about how to attack this. And I'll see you on Tuesday.